Hi, everybody. It's Andy and Josh, and this is our first episode of what are we calling it? Cardboard Chronicles podcast. It's uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our first uh, guest, Jeffrey Lichtman. Uh, Jeff has an astonishing, diverse collection, which we will delve into for sure, uh, ranging from the late 1800s to uh, Derek Jeter, modern era. Uh, he also is uh, a well-known attorney uh, who's done some business in the hobby, and we can't wait to get started interviewing him. So without further ado, we introduce Jeffrey Lickman. Thanks for having me, guys. You got it. All right, so, you know, let's start out with um, the most basic question, which is really, first of all, it's really hard for us to come up with questions because we, we've we gone over looking at your your cards and they're just, I mean, mind-boggling. But just on, on a basic level, would you remember when you first were, your first baseball card or when you started collecting and what that experience was like when you started? Well, there's two different phases of my collection, I suppose, my collection life. One of them was when I was a kid, obviously. I think I was about the earliest cards I remember collecting were probably the 1970 top super cards. You know, those large okay. cards. You know, Boog Power sure. was the rare one in that uh, set. And I still have those cards. I have all the cards that I collected as a kid. Um, and I collected sets uh, from Renata Galasso, if you're from... Uh, the Northeast, you know who she is. She was in the back of Sporting News, was a newspaper back then, and you could order an entire top set. She would get, obviously, a tremendous amount of cards um, and then break them down into sets. Otherwise, when you were a kid, you had to buy them by the pack and put them together, so it took forever. You sent $13 to Renata Galasso in Brooklyn, and six to eight weeks later, you got your set. You put them into plastic sheets. You put them into loose-leaf uh, notebooks. And boom, there you had it. So I collected as a kid from probably age five, just sets really, probably until around age 18 or so. Then I took some time off for college, got interested in other things. And then the second phase of my collection started when I was a lawyer, a young lawyer, starting to make some money. And all of a sudden, and this happens with every adult that's still a child inside, that uh, Josh, you'll see in, in 40 years, um, you are just as immature as an adult as you were as a kid. Um, but what happens is that you now have money. And I remember as a kid, you know, begging my mother, can you take me to, it was uh, the Linden in Linden, New Jersey, which was like a drugstore slash convenience store. And they had, of course, decks, packs of cards that were at the front by the cash register. That's where I used to get my baseball cards. And now as an adult, I could just go on eBay because that was really the main source. Uh, and I was only collecting modern cards from when I was a kid. And you could just buy whatever you wanted. And all of a sudden, I see these plastic holders. And I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know what PSA was. I didn't know what SGC was. And I represent SGC now. And um, at the time, I didn't know. And I started poking okay, around. What, what year is this about? Oh, God. this is. I can actually pin it down. I think it's probably... Sometime in the uh, late 90s. So oh, okay. I was aware. Okay. I was probably like 32, 33. Thanks. And um, the first vintage card, the first purchase I bought in my second phase of my, of my collection life was a vintage card. It was a T206 Nat Lajaway, and it was an 8OC, which I still yes. have. And which I didn't even which, know what, which pose was it? It was the uh, throwing. And oh, okay. I, I didn't even know what OC meant. You know, I didn't know that. And I noticed, obviously, after that, the top border was a little smaller than the bottom border. But I remember that it was before there were sniping services. And I just had to quickly figure out what the card was worth. There was no VCP. And, you know, I remember thinking, you know, every once in a while, I have a smart thought that passes through my head. And I remember thinking, I have no idea what this thing is worth. And I have no doubt that I'm probably going to get ripped off but I'm going to keep this card for decades. And I suspect that the market will go up and whatever mistake I made now, um, it'll be forgiven as time goes on. And I spent like $500 on an 8OC and getting it was, it was like an addiction. It started, it was like the first 
a bit of crack cocaine that I had, and oh I was pretty God, stopped. Yeah. And it started from my collection was all over the place. It was first cars that I thought were pretty, that were interesting. I was buying anything and everything. I was looking at some of these M116s and thinking, my God, look at the blue and the pastel. And I couldn't get over I'm buying like Earl Moore cards, and I didn't even know who he was. Eventually, I settled in. I started buying Ty Cobbs. I started buying Hal Chases because he was a, a Is this a famous, still in the 90s? This was still probably in the 90s. He was a famous criminal, and I'm a criminal defense lawyer. So okay. I thought, wow, this is interesting. I read a book about Hal Chase. And I started buying all of his cards. And back then, you know, I was buying cards that no one even wanted. You know, the cycle backs, the bizarro backs. Um, so I made a lot of smart decisions then. And what I've learned as a collector is that the more you buy, the, the greater likelihood is that you're going to make some smart choices. Of course, every card I sold um, was an utter, an unmitigated disaster. So right. I ended up, uh, of course, evening out over time. But, you know, there's an addiction. And as I got older, I remember buying that Lajaway card and the pain of spending $500 on a card. I remember because I have a one, one, one gift that I have is I can remember back in time from any age of my life and remember exactly how it felt at that moment. And I look back at spending on that Lajaway card and I remember being nervous. Like, you know, I didn't have kids then. And am I going to be taking away from their college fund? I mean, these are the thoughts that I had. <laughs> I remember having those thoughts as I was getting ready to press the button with three seconds left, putting in my own, you know, uh, 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 manual snipe and getting the card and falling in love with it. And, you know, years later, I'm spending six figures on a card. I'm not even thinking twice about it. It's just like, okay, you know. It, but this is how the addiction is, and it's a real addiction. The way I've been able to rationalize it is the same way you've been able to rationalize it, Andy, and the way Josh will soon be able to rationalize it, is you think, well, I'm actually saving money doing this because this is an invest. This is an investment, and uh, it's better than spending it on stupid things. I'm not, I'm not a drinker. I don't do you know. drugs. You know, and that's how you rationalize it, and that's the wonderful thing about the hobby and it, but the crazy thing is, is it wasn't, and I'm going on, I'm, I'm answered your question. You asked That's a very great. direct, yeah. simple question. I'm giving you a monologue. Um, you're a, you're I remember always thinking about my collection as it grew. And this was cards that I was probably at the time spending tens of thousands of dollars on cards. This was for years. I never considered my cards as part of my portfolio, my personal finances. To me, it was always something extra. Whatever I spent on cards was just a fun thing, and I never considered anything financial in terms of planning, but you get older. And what changed it for me, I had never sold a card up to this point. I get an offer out of the blue on a, a rare Ty Cobb postcard. This is only 10, 15 years ago, and I bought the card for like $3,000 because I thought it was cool, and somebody offered me 35000 for it. And I was like, oh, holy shit. These what, did you, actually, what did you do? I sold it. And I regret sold it. it. Okay. And I regret right, it. Right, um, See, so like, think you're saying things right now that, not no, Josh, I don't know if you're realizing it, Josh, but like, you're in this one answer, you're literally touching on like every single question that we had for this whole thing. So it's like, you say <laughs> one thing, I want to jump in right away and ask <laughs> you about it, but you keep going. And I like, then there's like another thing. I'm like, oh my God, that. <laughs> It's, well, it's a, it's, it's a re well, it's something you said. It's like really true about, um, I, it was exactly how I feel. Um, I don't really think I never really thought of my cards as an investment, but when you said you feel like, um, you're actually saving money and it's so it's literally, I've thought that because, you know, I'm, it, it's money that I, I'm now not going to be spending. It's, it's literally not going to be spending. So I, I have, I have, I'm in the meat business. And my business is very cash intensive, but we're always, we always are looking to borrow money. We're always using borrowed funds. We're always using our own money. Uh, it's a cash flow negative business. So we're always paying people before we get paid. And sometimes I find myself where we're super busy and our money's all out in inventory. We've got meat coming in from all over, all over the place. And I say, holy shit, I need some, I need some cash. I need, I need money. And I think to myself, I go, I'm so poor. And then I go, 
wait, wait, wait. And I realized, well, the last three years, all the profit that I've made, I didn't spend it. It's sitting in my cards. I have cards. I go, well, let me go look. I was, I started buying T206 cards and I'm like, you know, I really got into T206 just before the pandemic. So like 20, end of 2018, 2019, maybe a year before it. I don't remember exactly. And, um, and all of a sudden I'm like, all right, well, I'll try and sell this card. And I was up maybe like a hundred percent on literally everything I had. So I was like, oh, well, the money that I made, I, placed it over here and now i have that money and then more so it's so true it really is as long as you don't make you know silly mistakes and buy fernando tatis you know one of ones i mean i think that's true i think as a vintage collector look we're obviously different than the modern collectors who are more into it for an investment and a flip um for me once i realized that i had this massive amount of cards that were, were worth a lot of money i said you know what I've got to at least do something responsible financially because look, I could have also put it into an index fund and I don't know that it would have made more money, but I don't know that it cost me any money. I think I probably at the very least um, did the same as if I invested all my money with a professional, but I got to enjoy the investment as opposed to owning some shitty stock, which means nothing to me. And I remember Mm -hmm. when my kids were getting ready for college, I said to myself, you know what? I remember as a young collector you have one of those college funds for your kids that you make when you're a young lawyer as any professional does i never had one of those and i remember uh, speaking to an old boss and he said to me you don't need uh, you're going to make a lot of money you'll see you don't need to have any of those college funds when you need to uh, send the tuition check for college you're just going to write the check it's not you don't need to save for it and i remember thinking how like silly that was but i vowed that when i my kids went to college and of course I wasn't so lucky to have any financial aid or any uh, scholarships that would help defray it. It's full freight in this household. I said, I'm never going to take a penny from my bank accounts. I'm going to sell cards and pay for four years of college. And wow. the first year was, I don't know, 150,000. I think tuition was, I have twins. So they both mm-hmm. went at the same time. I sold like three cards. <laughs> and, and and that was the that was freshman year of college. You're still you're still crying about those cards, though. <laughs> of course I am. I mean, I sold a bunch. The, the way you sell, just so you know, this is you guys know this, or Josh, you'll learn. There are different layers of selling. You first sell the stuff that you've grown bored of and you don't care about. And there's uh, on the level of regret from the scale of one to ten. Ten being you want to you know hang yourself after. Um, it's like a two. It's still not a zero. Because you still have some regrets, even though there are cards that you don't care about anymore. They still like a regret cool. would be like you, you sell something that you, you're bored of, and then you're like, "Man, why did I do that? That thing's going to be worth three times the price in like a year." It's it's that's part of it, and also I you know I've it's I've been fortunate, I suppose, with my practice that there's never been a time that I've looked at my cards and said, "Man, this thing needs to go up in value." Because, thank God. And so I'm, I'm like a child when I collect. Um, the only cars that I've ever bought for investment purposes only have been a disaster. Um, disaster. It's, been, it's just been stupid. And I realize you buy what you love. And the reason why you make smart financial decisions <clears throat> when you buy what you love is because you know the issue so well. You have such ingrained knowledge in your there's head. Also you that, there's also that... There's also that intrinsic value. Like you said something like, you know, I got to enjoy it. There was a card that I bought, you know, Jay Kaplan, right? Yeah. You know, obviously you've traded with him, I'm sure. Uh, so he had bought from a guy who wanted at auction a 1915 uh, Cracker Jack Joe Jackson. It was a PSA one, as bad a one as you can imagine. It, it looked maybe, maybe a little mold. I don't know if there's mold, but definitely holes in it. Um, but I wanted a 1914. I just can't afford it right now so jay got it from the guy who got it and we made a trade and i'm into it for about 16 grand this is about six months ago it sat on my desk every day it li- like literally like i have like cards right here like these are two cards that are sitting right in front of me i had the joe jackson sitting right here um right when i got it i loved it and i was uh, uh, amazed by it but i was like oh there's so many other cards i want i couldn't stand looking at the the, the poor quality of it and in my other cards, I'm trying to like grade up. And for some reason, I was like, I just don't love the card. 
So it sat here every day, and I did enjoy it every day. And about a week ago, I sold it for just under seventeen thousand dollars. And in my head, in the, in my head, I'm doing the math. I go, all right, well, if I'm borrowing money, which I'm not borrowing money at the moment, but if I'm borrowing money, I do the percentage. I go, I basically scratched. So when I sold it to the guy, um, you know, he goes, you know, how'd you do it? You know, I see that you know it sold for sixteen grand at an auction. You made a thousand bucks. I go, well, I'm really not into it like that. I go, but I probably scratched or lost a little money. And he goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize. I go, no. I looked at it every day. I'm looking at a 107-year-old card of Joe Jackson every day. I got that enjoyment out of it. And to me, that was worth, you know, but of course. scratch. That was, it, was, it was, you know, who gets to sit with a $16,000 card in front of them on a daily basis? It was, it was a miraculous experience. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the, the joy of being a collector and also being someone that cares about money. It's to me, when you've got people that are only concerned about the money phase of it, it's just such a, it's just such a turnoff. I just can't turn deal. Off. I can't deal. And, and, you know, I've got like a serious collection. So I understand that people think, well, you must care about the money. I don't really care about the money. I mean, eventually I've got to sell them. I recognize that I can't keep these cards forever, but it's never been about the finances. And once it becomes part of the finances it just gets ruined it just becomes another pain in the ass in your life what you want is you know look i work really hard this is memorial day weekend i was in a federal prison on friday when everybody's driving out to the shore or the hamptons wherever the hell they're going i was in a federal prison meeting with a, a, a financer of terrorism that was my friday Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah saturday i get a phone call from a woman her husband's been arrested on the most horrific crimes imaginable. I've been doing this for 33 years. I've represented Tr all kinds. Trimming, like, trimming T206 cards? Yes, tr trimming cards, exactly. The most <laughs> horrific cards. So for 24 hours, I was dealing with trying to get him out on bail. Uh, the prosecutor wanted him re remanded, which means no bail. And finally, at 12.15 um, in the morning, this past uh, night, I was in court in Manhattan getting him out on bail got home, got to bed around 2 a.m. I mean, this is this is the weekend. I've got a lot of stress on a holiday weekend. You know what? If I can find something in my life that gives me joy and some kind of relief, I'm going to hold on to it like grim death. And that's really, you know, what collecting is to me. It's, to me, it's sacred. It's holy. And when it starts becoming just a financial thing, I understand. You spend seven figures on cards a year. There's got to be some financial thinking involved. But we're not sure. idiots. You know, I mean, you know, I, I've spent money on cards that I knew I was overpaying for significantly, but I wanted to complete a set. I've blown five thousand mm -hmm. dollars more than what a card was worth. I didn't care because I recognized the fact that you win some, you lose some, you never know where you're gonna get your wins from as well. Well, so, that brings me to oh go ahead, Josh. Oh yeah, I was gonna say to your point, um I, I to the inverse of your point, you have this amazing T206 Ty Cobb uh, miscut green card. Um, and you were telling us that at a time where this is around $500, you passed up an offer at $10,000, right? Which is insane. And now this card's worth more than triple that, more than quadruple that. How did you predict this? How did you predict the values were going to go up? Did you, did you just want to keep it because, uh, you know, personal well, value? Like I said at the beginning, if you buy a lot of stuff, you can really look like a genius when the when the hits are big. But of course, there's a lot of misses. With that, you know, I was very early. The things that I'm I'm proud of that I was smart about. I was very early in buying Ty Cobb postcards, um, rare one of ones, one of twos. I was buying them for a few thousand dollars, and they're worth anywhere. You know, I have high grades, thirty, forty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars. I bought tons of those. Because I remember thinking, you know, they're just big baseball cards. And the bigger the baseball card, the more fun it is. It wasn't like I was buying, you know, T3s that might be unwieldy. The postcards weren't that much bigger than a baseball card. So I would buy these cards. And I remember being on Net54, and I bought a Deech Fielding PSA 5, the most beautiful yeah, PSA sure. 5. I, uh, I was uh, looking at it five minutes ago. It's, it's, it looks like an 8. Um, and there's a six, there's only one graded higher and it's horrible. It's got snow all over that very black uh, background. Right. And I remember spending, you can find it on VCP, I think like $3,100 for, 
And somebody on Net54, somebody who hated me, there's a lot of them, uh, said, <laughs> what an idiot, openly said, he wrote it, this guy's an idiot, he doesn't know what he's doing, he spent $3,100 uh, on this card, he overpaid, and I'm thinking, this guy was a, his, he ended up going to jail for something, he was a, 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 a cockfighter, you know, he had the roosters that he had put razors. Yeah. Obviously, you did not defend him. No, these are the imbeciles that are in the hobby. It's filled with idiots, which is why it allows somebody like me to actually make money on my purchases. Okay. And he's like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. And I'm thinking, if you think I overpaid, what is it ever, does it ever cross your mind that the amount of money that I spend on cards is because I'm really smart and I earned that money? You don't just, you know, unless you're like somebody who fell into a lot of money uh, you know, you're a rich kid. You have rich parents. My father was uh, was a meat packer. Uh, you know, unless you you know have that? somebody who gave you money, you have to earn the money. And there's, I'm not saying that every person that has a lot of money is smart, but there is a strong correlation with the amount of income you have and with your intelligence. I'm not saying it's exact. There's a lot of rich, stupid people, and there's a lot of poor, really brilliant people that I know. But on average, the more money you make. Usually, the smarter you are. I'm thinking you well, stupid. That's, well, of course, that, that's I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dumb. It's really, really interesting. What Josh is pointing out is that, like, it's not even just the values and how you value stuff. It's that you know, when I was looking through your Cobb collection and especially the postcards, and I, I've, I've, I've been into Cobb for maybe you know five years. You know, that's it. Five, five years max, and uh, maybe, maybe six. And uh, I've seen a lot of cards. And I had the Deutsche. I had the batting. I remember when I bought it, I'm like, this is so undervalued. And I think, you know, I, maybe I made my... But I, I ended up not liking the postcard. But I'm looking at these cards. And I'm like, there are cards in here that nobody's ever seen. That Nobody's ever, ever seen these cards. Like, that's what's crazy is that it's not even that you have some really cool cards. You've got some cards that are that nobody else has. Like I'm going to I'm going to go find one right now. It's just like it be like well first of all I love I love the like the Brunners. Those are just like insane and you have a, a sick cop. But there was a there was a, a postcard that I was going through. Um like it's the the 1908 um American League Publishers Company postcard. Then there's a 1908 free free press postcard. Everyone's seen the Deutsche ones. I mean, even the fielding one, which is the rarer ones. People have seen them. But there are 1910 brush postcards. Nobody they, nobody even knows. Even Cobb collectors well, don't know they exist. You know what? The, the, the brush postcards that I have, you see that I have doubles of most of them. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's 10 cards in a set, and there's two Huey Jennings. So right. there's okay. a total of, of, of 10 cards you can get. And I've got one complete SGC set, and I've got eight of the 10 cards in PSA. I've got 18 graded. There's only like right. 28 graded total between SGC and PSA of the entire set. And I've actually, that's the third. I have two cobs right now. I've owned two others that I sold. What about that? Okay. Okay. So the, okay, the topping and company, I love that thing. You've got this, uh, it's the one with the star. Uh, I've only, only last year did I see those things, but like the rose, you've got, you know, anyone just getting a rose postcard, uh, you know, of a common player is not easy. And you got to pay like a thousand bucks just for a common player and you've got a cop. I mean, it's, 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 la it's, and it's a three. It's, it's funny. It's funny. Like your collection is funny. I mean, it's funny that like, you. it's not even like you have every cob and they're like, you know, cut in half, but they're like superior quality. Well, but I wanted to buy cards. You know, I didn't want to be a collector that just because of the power of having money could just buy whatever you wanted. I didn't right. want to be that kind of collector because to me, you know, I've been collecting since I'm five years old. I've been collecting for over 50 years. I didn't want to be the kind of collector who, you know, just was, oh, I can spend a tremendous amount of money and get a high population card in, in high grade. And boy, look at me. You know, I've got a PSA 8. That's why I don't have any PSA 8 um, T206 cobs because I didn't want to be that guy. I wanted to be someone that was finding cards that nobody else had and getting them in the highest grade possible. So like the Detroit Free Press, which is the smiling cob, 
He's also yeah. on one of the uh, the same images on the Buster Brown and Morton's pins, the same smiling cop. It's a very rare pose, that is. There's only two that have ever been graded. The other one is so badly trimmed at the bottom, you see that it's got a big, fat, white border at the bottom. The other mm -hmm. one that, that in his existence is an A, and the border on the bottom is as wide as the border on top, so probably a half an inch was taken off. Those are the only two in existence, and mine is it's spectacular. It looks like an eight. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, you, one question that we can almost skip over because you almost answered it was, you know, we are talking about, um, you had talked about all these how chase cards and like all these crazy backs when nobody cared about it. We were going to ask, like, you know, you have uh, probably, I mean, I know somebody who's got, uh, who is it? Is it um, uh, Joe Rand that's got the crazy uh, how chase collection? But I think yours is like probably 10 times what he has. And he would probably, you know, want every single one of your cars. You have every back possible. I mean, of every, uh, of everything. And it's, you know, I'm missing and I, a couple. I, I'm missing I think a the couple. answer to how you did that is that you started when nobody gave a shit. No, it used to be, if you remember, that PSA, when they graded cards, they didn't grade by the back. The back <laughs> phenomenon became something that only was into fashion the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years. So a lot of the the chase backs that I have, you see, there's a red Hindu. Um, yeah, PSA it's like five. a five. Yeah. Okay. Incredible. If you look at the <laughs> yeah. pop report, there's only going to be one five, and that's not my card. There's actually two fives. Mine is one that's not categorized on the pop report because at that time it didn't exist. So when that card sold as a five, the other one, people, I think it was Heritage, they were advertising it as a one of one. And I'm thinking. And ain't a one of one because I've got it on, you know, go to my Flickr, you'll see the other one. So a ton of those backs are not uh, reflected in the population report. Yeah. But and, you know, you look at a cool. you look at a card like and I'm not into the the Piedmont uh factory forty twos, but um, you know, they're rare they're rare. <laughs> You've got a six and a half blue portrait. And <laughs> that's what I mean when I say it's funny, because you know, um, it's so rare, but here you are. You have, like, I'm not going to look at the pop. I'm guessing that's a pop one, and there's none higher, and probably the next one is probably, like, a PSA one uh, because yeah. there just aren't those around. Uh, the the missing trim, I mean, the missing ink I insanity. So we've been talking about your, you know, your amazing card collection, right? But you also have a huge part in the hobby itself. Um, one of your most famous cases that you worked on was the Bill Mastro case, and I believe you represented the victims of that case. Is that correct? Well, I represented some victims and ended up having to sue uh, the, the people related to Mastro for shill bidding. Um, but this was a, maybe the first time really in my life as a defense lawyer. I represent people accused of crimes. In the Mastro prosecution, I represented a lot of not only the victims, but also his co-conspirators who testified against him in the grand jury to help getting him indicted. And wow. normally that's the kind of legal work that makes me nauseous. I don't like representing, you know, what we would call in the vernacular rats. I don't like representing cooperators because you don't have to be a smart lawyer to represent a cooperator. The hard stuff is keeping somebody out of jail. The hard stuff is winning a trial. Or getting bail at uh, twelve thirty at night for a guy that's you know potentially facing the rest of his life in prison, but for that case because the cards meant so much to me, it was so you know holy to me. When I had the opportunity to represent people that were going to put him in jail, I took it and I ran with it. I represented a ton of them, and over the years I've represented other bad people, you know, so-called bad people in the hobby. But I've done it with the eye of them admitting their wrongdoings. You know, perhaps, in fact, almost every time avoiding jail, but it was for the betterment of the hobby. And, and that's why I did it. So my practice as a criminal defense lawyer in the hobby is completely different than what it is in real life as my regular criminal defense clients. I mean, I've represented John Gotti Jr., got an acquittal for him. I represented El Chapo. You've named it. I've represented them, you know, throughout the world in some of the biggest trials ever. But for the hobby, um, I've represented a lot of uh, bad people and helped them to clean up the hobby. It's worth it to me. It's not a big part of my practice, but right. I would say in the hobby, I'm probably one of the, maybe the only criminal defense lawyer that actually understands cards and can also do this at a high level. So yeah, and just, a just, uh, okay. I was going to say, and just as uh, a little backing for those who don't know that are listening, 
um, Bill Mastro, what he's so known for, or that he did, was one, he chill bitted his cards, and two, he trimmed cards. The most famous one was the Hannes Wagner, in which he graded as a PSA 8 and sold, and I believe now in Ken Kendrick's hands. Um, and because it's such a huge card, it's become one of the most famous cases in the hobby's history, and that's what we've been talking about. Yeah, yep. super, super cool. Yeah, uh, here's a here's a follow up question: Have you ever taken trade in baseball cards? Like, you have a client that that you're like, uh, listen, you, here's your bill. It's it's three hundred fifty thousand dollars. No, however, I've never had anybody. Actually, I've never had anybody offer me cards because any of the cards they would have would be stuff I wouldn't be interested in. I have such an eclectic um, interest in cards. Um, I've had people offer me other bizarre things as a defense lawyer. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's like you're a defense lawyer. I've got to run a practice. I've got a huge overhead. I've got people I've got to pay. Nobody else in my law firm brings in any business. It's just me. So I'm paying for everybody and their families. So I can't really take something that may not be liquid. It's got to go into the bank. Gotcha. And have to pay bills. So you just said something about like your, your collection being eclectic. What do you think? I have my own personal opinions, and there, and I don't, I don't think highly of it. But tell me what you think of the hobby today and this ultra modern, this manufactured value, you know, card created yesterday that is now tomorrow worth you know one hundred fifty grand. Uh, what's your thoughts on, on that? And there, there is listen, there is value to a lot of this, these things. There's market. So what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, look, I think that there's a lot of money to be made in the modern market. I don't want to disparage it completely because then I'm going to sound like an old guy who's saying, get off my grass. I don't want to be that guy. So I recognize the fact that there's people making a lot of money. A lot of the money that's being made is due to fraud, uh, trimming and whatnot. Um, you know, the whole NFT thing I thought was idiotic. And of course, it was idiotic. Um, what I think my major beef with that is, is that it's just populated by people that don't care about the cards don't care about the history and they just want to make a quick buck and they're just moving from one industry to the next uh, and hoping to make a quick buck before they move on to the next one. I mean, the reason why I love baseball cards is because baseball is Americana. There is history in these cards, every last bit of it. When I touch them, when I smell them, when I look at them, I can see a, a bygone era where to me it, it feels like the world was better then. So I care about history, and that's why I care about baseball cards. I don't want to hear right. about, you know, a, a PSA 10 Michael Jordan. I just don't care. Garbage. Garbage. It's garbage. <laughs> I mean, you know, my, my theory on the Michael Jordan cards was there are more PSA 10s available in the world than people that can afford them. And yep. that, from a standpoint of, you know, uh, you know uh, supply and demand, does not sustain. It just doesn't. So this is something that I really want to ask you about. Um, you said something about um, a card that you may have overpaid for, for like five grand that you didn't care about. And I've done that too. You know, I just paid for uh, a Lundgren Kansas City offback, uh, a shitty two with like a mark on the back. I paid like $1,500 for it. I actually have an amazing PSA four and a half that I paid way less than. But I needed one more because I needed it for my off-back binder. That's not what I'm interested in, where you overpay willingly for a card. But what what about, have you ever heard the term anchor card? Sure. Okay. So anchor card, when I first heard it, I thought it meant a card that is like the centerpiece of your collection. And that's not what it was described to me as. Anchor card is a card that you bought that you just can't fucking get rid of. Um, and my anchor card, I literally just got rid of it last week. I had a 1910 Old Mill Casey Stengel rookie. Loved the shit out of that card. Loved it. It was a PSA 3. I got it in a trade with a big dealer out in uh, on the West Coast. Uh, and I think I was probably into it for maybe 17 grand. I've had it for like three, four years. Um, I didn't really, there weren't many comps. There's not many cards. There's only like six or eight of them, I think, that exist. So I could not, For you know, it's not that I didn't want the card forever. It was that I got into so many other cards, I had to like cut it out. So I was like, all right, this one I'll go. I could not get rid of it. I couldn't. I offered it. There's someone who's offering a PSA one for like 18 grand. Uh, another, you know, my, I, I figured what, after three years, the value was like $34,000. It, it just wasn't. It just wasn't sellable. I finally ended up selling it back to the guy I bought it from. 
and I think I made, I think I made like three or four grand on the card. But it was I would have sold it if he said I'll, I'll pay you seventeen. I would have taken seventeen. He paid me like twenty or twenty one, twenty one grand. To me, that's an anchor card. What is your anchor card that you you look at? You can't even stand looking at it anymore because you don't want it and you just can't sell it. And you're not going to sell it for a crazy loss. It's worth more, but like you just can't sell it. I don't think I have a single one because the, the way I look at the cards is, you know, I know I have cards that I overpaid for, but they're usually cards that I love. Um, there are plenty of cards that I know that I, I'm never going to get my money back out of. I don't, I just don't care. I just would sell it and whatever you can get out of it is money that you can use for something else in your life. I view it financially as, you know, not an anchor, but it's just the cost of doing business because for every shitty buy that you have, you, you can't get them. What, you, what you're describing is typical of not just collectors, but human nature is that you don't want to get rid of it because you feel that you paid a certain amount of money for, and therefore you're not going to be able to feel okay with it unless you can get at least your money back because mm -hmm. you don't want to feel like you made an, you, you lost something. You lost sure. this transaction. But the truth is there's wins and, and losses every day of your life in all sorts of uh, other areas, and you can't get obsessed with trying to win every deal. In, in order to move forward, sometimes you have to lose. You know, sometimes yep. you get so, you know, uh, bogged down with trying to get rid of that one card that you miss other opportunities. So my view is it's like ripping off a Band-Aid. You know, letting it become an anchor card to you yep. is not psychologically worth the value of it. Just sell it. It's It stings for a second, and you'll make it up. You'll make up. Let's say you sold it for 12000 I had a card that I loved uh, that I sold in a recent auction, and I think REA that I was thought was going to sell for twenty thousand. I paid sixteen for. I ended up it ended up selling for like twelve seven. I was pissed. It was a one of one. I couldn't believe it went so cheaply. And at the and same time, it? it was a it was a homes to homes Walter Johnson um, okay. with a completely intact back. So it means it wasn't taken out of a scrapbook. It was probably a salesman sample because there was no number on the bottom. But it was completely okay. unique. I bought it for sixteen thousand a few years ago. I ended up selling it for like high twelves. I couldn't believe that it didn't sell. That's great 20. advice. But, that, great but advice. that's how it is. In the same you know, auction, I had cards that I thought were going to sell for three thousand. It sold for seven thousand. You just right. realize if you start. This Your is first what I loss is also you know in my in my business I'm really good at taking losses. In fact, not that I love taking losses. I love the process of taking losses. It's pretty cathartic. It's like you. It's like closing a door, and moving. And, and I, for good. some reason, I've been unable to do that in it, with baseball cards. Maybe because I'm also I don't get a, a, you know emotionally attached to you know ground turkey that I have in the of freezer. Course. I get emotionally attached to you know a Ty Cobb. Even if it's not my car or, or the Casey Stengel, it's hard for me to lose it when I find such a value in it. But yeah, that's great advice. But but that's really the problem. Is. That's the, there's positives with having your investment being something that you love. The highs are that you get to enjoy your share of stock as a baseball card as opposed to you know Microsoft shares. But the negative is that you get emotionally wedded to it, and it's difficult to get rid of them. I mean, some of the, the best collectors I know are people that can't get rid of their cards. And I said, what do you do? You're just going to die with these cards? This is the mentality. At some point, you have to realize that everything is a means to an end, and you let go of it. Um, you know, the cards that should hurt are the ones that you're selling because uh, you love the card, and you have to sell it for a reason that maybe isn't the best reason. Those are the regrets you should have a life. Getting rid of some card that means nothing to you, my view is you just can make it back, not just in your collection, but you can make it back in other aspects of life. I mean, I'm a criminal lawyer. Um, I've got cases that I'm working on. Some of them I'm billing by the hour. If I spend an extra half an hour on uh, on a case one day, well, there's the money that I lost uh, on that card. Right. You have to just look at it that way. It's just not worth it otherwise. It, it just becomes too much of an obsession, which is what this hobby Oftentimes it's so it is. to uh, to the country of uh, of the question that we just asked. Is there any card that you're most proud of having? Hmm. Well, proud it can be described as two ways as a collector. Some people are proud of the cards that they spend an extraordinary amount of money 
on and they feel, look at my precious card. Look at, you know, it's like the Gollum with the ring and Lord of the Rings, you know, my precious, my precious. Those cards don't interest me as much. It's the cards that you picked, the diamonds from the rough. I would say the card that means the most to me in my entire collection is a card that I paid $8,000 for many years ago is the Detroit Free Press Cobb postcard. And I bought it in a Lou Lipset auction raw. And I also bought, if you look, guys, on my Hugh Jennings collection, there's also a Detroit Free Press Hugh Jennings. Um, and I didn't know whether these cards were going to be trimmed or not. Lou, you know, was a, you know, a, a godfather of collecting. But it was What does it look era. like? I'm going to, I'm going to, find it right here the detroit free press one yeah okay it's the smiling cob oh this uh i'm, I'm on the jennings oh the jennings it's a, a the same card white card with sort of like the grayish uh giant picture of of uh okay jen i think it's 1908 okay and i bought those two cards together you know lose auctions were almost completely raw. Some of the cards were, were trimmed. It wasn't because he was trimming. It's because he was buying and selling. And when he was buying and selling, he, you know, the cards weren't graded. It was a different era. He was buying these cards decades ago. So you sort of bought the cards knowing that there was a very real possibility the cards could be trimmed. And this was in a Lou Lipset auction, which was a very bizarre format. It was really, really old. It was like internet from 1993. And uh, I ended up buying the Cobb and the Jennings together. No one had ever seen those cards. And I got yeah. them graded by SGC. Um, and, you know, years later, when it, the card became, you know, wow, look at this card. I had bought it when nobody else even really wanted it. $8,000 so, is a lot of money, but now it's did worth you say, that. Is Incredible. this is this uh, is this picture seen anywhere else of Cobb, that smile? I've never seen that. I mean, that smile. Yeah, it's... um. If you look at my Morton's pins, they're yellow pins. Uh -huh. They're 1909 and 1910. They're Buster Brown um, bread pins. Two different okay. years. It's the same smiling cob as in there. Okay. Are there any cobs or any cards that you've been on the hunt for that you just haven't been able to get and that you are still looking for? You might not want to tell us because then, you know, it's not like no, we're going to be able to cock block you i mean i'm pretty i'm pretty transparent because you know right. my view on collateral look, this is a i'm a criminal defense lawyer by training which means i'm highly competitive um sure. yeah there have been yeah. other cop collectors i can think of one cop collector who i absolutely can't stand because he's also a fraudster he's a well-known fraudster in the hobby and i'm going to be blunt here because i don't care i've got more money than him and every <laughs> time there would be a cob that would be coming up that was rare even ones right. that I had, if you see, I've got a lot of doubles and I've got a lot of triples of rare sure. cards, like the uh, Star Candy uh, card from 1928. There's like mm -hmm. four graded. I've got two of them. There's so many cards of which I've got most of the population. But I knew that he was after these cards. So every time, no matter what he was trying to do, I would just buy the card, no matter what it cost, because the money was less important to me than crushing his spirit. And that's what I did. And finally, I let him have, there's two cards graded of one of my cards. I let him have the one that was graded A. It was trimmed. I have right. it in mine as a five. Um, and I let him have that, but only after I ran it up to you know an exorbitant price. Well, so in, in terms of cards, your question was, are there any cobs that I don't have that I want? I don't think there's anything that you don't have. There's one card. There's one card that I have that um, I don't know that I've ever seen for sale, um, that no one even knows what it looks like except for a few people, is I believe it's the Washington Times Ty Cobb. It's um, a baseball card. It's kind of like crimson colored. Uh, Dan McKee either owns it now or owned it. I don't know if you sure, know. Sure, okay. Dan. Yeah, Dan of course. The, I love Dan. He's one of the best I, guys I bought, in the I bought one of my, uh, my, my blue, what was it, uh, my, what was it? The uh, 1948 Leaf uh, Joe DiMaggio's. No, that can't mm -hmm. be right. Where, the, where there's like different colors. I bought the blue one from him. 
Yeah, he's great. Nice. Yeah, he's, great a, he's you know, and he's a decent guy. He's a funny guy. Oh, yeah. He's a warm guy. Let me give you one quick story about regret from selling. Um, the few Please. cards that I've sold have been massive disasters. They probably sell for 10 times, 15 times what I sold them for. But one card out of the blue um, was a 1948 Leaf Jackie Robinson. That was a PSA 7. I paid $700 for it. Okay. And out of the blue, I had no idea what it was worth because the card hadn't sold in so many years. This is a few years ago. Um, right. The I get a, an offer from a broker, somebody that was buying for a client, offers me nineteen thousand five hundred for it. And okay. as I said, I paid seven hundred. I quickly boxed the card up, <laughs> sent, right. sent it over to him. This has right. got to be two thousand and fifteen, maybe. Um, okay. And he gets the card and he says, "You know, there's a crack in the slab." He's like, I'm going to send it back to PSA uh, to get re-slabbed. I said, you know, I'm sorry. I don't like this. I packed. I did. I'm sure it was my fault. Um, I know where I this is be, going. I can be absent-minded. So he sends it to PSA. PSA is like, there's a crack in the holder, and we don't know if it's a real card. I'm like, what? I'm like, I paid, you know, $700 for it like <laughs> 10 years earlier. I'm right. like, of course it's real. What, are you going to fake a card that's worth $700? <laughs> It was ridiculous, and it was an obviously real card. Um, so they say we're not going to grade it, and they cracked it out. It had like a minor crack. They cracked it out. I would have taken it back with the crack in the slab. So the right. broker calls me up, and he's like, look, man, I'm really sorry, but they won't grade the card. Can I get my money back? No. I'm like, well, what does it look like? And he shows me a picture, and it's raw. And I'm like, dude, what the <laughs> fuck? I'm like, why did you let him crack it out of the slab before they determined – I'm like the card's real. I, I look. I like. I don't know better than PSA mm -hmm. what a real card is. I, I I've spent 50 years collecting, not right. three weeks. I'm not. I'm not a monkey. They found off of Craigslist <laughs> to grade their card. Right. So he sends it back to me, and I'm like, you know what? This is how I view life. I'm not going to fight the guy. I sent him back. I wired back the 19.5. I kept the card. I tossed it in my, and it was a nice seven. It was. A, it was a, a grade. It should have been higher. And I just kind of forgot about it. Again, I chalked it up to you win some and you lose some. I was frustrated about it. I was pissed the card got broken out. Anyway, that card takes off. And I mean takes off. Takes off. It's a, a, a six-figure card, easy now. And right. one day I just take it out of the desk. I send it in to get graded. Comes back to 7.5. And I've got the card. And and if I would have, the guy would have kept it, it would have cost me. See, that's amazing. I thought you were going to say that they regraded it for him and it was a 7, 5, or an 8. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. What? So what that, about, that's an interesting story. That's amazing. I, I just, you know, and I don't know how much time you have, but I, have, I, I was just going through your cops again. And I'm looking at this 1914, it's not enough 15, 1914 Cobb Cracker Jack. And you have, it's a five. It's awesome. And I don't really know how they grade Cracker Jacks. Because I see ones that look like fives. I see fives that look like twos. This is a five that looks like a five. It looks awesome. Um, so do you still have this card? Yeah, all those cards okay. are right. Okay. Okay, so Cracker Jacks have taken off in the past, like, 20, 12 months. Okay. I don't know if they've doubled, tripled, quadrupled. But, but Cobbs, for sure, through the roof. Like, a few months ago, Probs Dean sells off his i think it was his collection uh and i think a four or a five cob went for like ridiculous money either are you not watching or are you watching and just not at all uh tempted when you see cards you have going for crazy amounts of money saying oh shit i'm gonna sell mine you know it's um, like I, I never sell a card for that reason. Do I look at the values? Yeah. I mean, my five, I think I paid 5000 for it. It's probably worth fifty now. I've got a 7.5, 1915. I'll quote you on that price. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a nutty one, what that one's worth <laughs> now. But do I look to see the cards go up? Yeah, it makes me feel better for rationalizing that this is an investment as opposed to just an idiot. By the way, is, that, by the way, is 50 grand, is that a firm offer right there? No, I wouldn't sell it. I, I, would, I, would, I couldn't sell that card because it's like part of my of my heart. It would be like losing a piece. It would be like selling one of my children. 
Um, you know, I can't, I can't sell that. I believe uh, that, it. That um, but I should, and at some point I'm going to have to. And I get. I think it's worth more than. Cards. I think it's. I think it's worth more than fifty. Just put it that might way. be, but I, I just can't bear to sell them now. I mean, look at what you don't want to have happen. And, and I, I look at Josh as someone that we can teach because he was he was us um, at one point. And I wish I had the knowledge then that I know now. What I would say is you don't want to have a situation. At least I don't think. I know people in the hobby that are living in. $400,000 houses that have collections worth $5 million, $10 right. million. Dollars. And they live like shit and they don't want to sell any of their cards because of the reasons we've talked about here. At some point you have to realize, and you know, you don't realize it when you're young, you're here for a finite amount of time on this earth and you might as well try to enjoy it, make your life a little bit easier. So at some point, at some point what I should be doing is taking all these cards selling them and not working anymore or right. i should be selling them and buying a house on the beach somewhere i should be doing that eventually i will because i don't want to be so old that when i have these cards and when i get rid of them uh, you know it's meaningless to me i can't do anything with the money you want to be able to enjoy it it's not like you're taking the money and you're going to buy something that's frivolous you're going to buy another asset but another asset right. that you can enjoy instead of being baseball cards that you enjoy, it could be a house on the beach that you enjoy. Don't be one of those right. people that's going to be, you know, poor, but collection rich. Do you not want, um, like not want a Ruth rookie or a Honus Wagner or an Eddie Plank? Do you not want those? Um, I never was that interested in them because I don't collect Ruth. I've got a couple of Ruths. I've got an exhibit, an expensive exhibit. Um, I think it's a five, you know, that famous exhibit with him you know, the, on the Yankees. Um, is it in the outfield like, one, that one? Yeah, I think it's 1921, yeah. is it? Is it it's 10, a 1921, yeah, I had that one. Yeah, I think mine's a five, I believe, or maybe, I'm not even sure. Um, I, never was, I never was a Ruth collector, and somebody once asked me, I got an unsolicited email once by someone who said to me, do you ever wish that when you were collecting cards early, Cobbs early, excuse me, Cobbs early, that it was Ruth instead of Cobb because the roots have gone up more. I would have had, you know, seven Ruth rookies and all the backs and they'd be worth a million dollars a piece now. And as I Man. wrote back to him, I said, well, financially, of course I, I wish I had bought the roots, but I would not be collecting anymore because I just don't really feel Babe Ruth. Um, Ty Cobb is incredibly, you know, it, it resonates with me. And it's not right. like I was collecting. It's not like the centerpiece of my collection was Wally Pip. You know, I'm collecting a guy who's maybe he's not number one in the hobby, but maybe he's number two or number three. So mm -hmm. would I ever buy, you know, look, at some point I'll probably buy a Ruth rookie just because, you know, I'm, a, you know, you, you become a follower to some extent in this, in this hobby. You want what's, what everybody else wants, but it's never been anything that meant anything to me. The Cobb stuff is so much more special to me because the Cobb cards are better. I mean, let's be honest, how many good uh, Babe Ruth cards, other than the, the Baltimore News Ruth, how many uh, Ruths are that interesting? Ten? There's not. There's not. There may, yeah, maybe ten. There's really not. There's there's yeah. more that come out these days, but I'm not really into those. And I think for the most part, you're right. There's hundreds of Cobbs, uh, all different kinds. Uh, what's right. funny is that in your Cobb collection, like the E102 Cobb, uh, I, I'm just thinking of that one because I had one. It was a really bad co copy, and I just sold it. Um, and uh, you have it's a card that I don't know where it is, but you have it uh, that that front, but it's the cotton back. <laughs> it's oh, like it yeah, got a lot of like it's got to be like one of the rarest ones. It's yeah. insane. It's really yeah. insane. I've got a lot of those. I mean, sometimes in terms of the, the same front, I had an E101 also that was in. A, in a PSA five that I sold um, to to somebody um, years ago, I regret selling it, but it was such a boring back, and it was the same front. It's not a big deal, and I made some money. Of course, it's probably worth. Which is the E one O? What's which is the one that um, I got? I, I, I you have one right here. It's a nineteen thirteen series notebooks. It's got the same front as I don't know if it's the it's the one that's got like the maroon back to it. Um, it's just Cobb. God, which, which Cobb is that? Um, I've never seen that back. And it's it, it, the one that you have says 1913. The one, the other one that I'm thinking of is a, a 1909, but like, I've never seen this one. Let me e see. Which one is. 
Which is E101 Cobb. Let's see what that one is. Well, the E101 is the same front as the E102. Oh, okay. Um, E103. Uh, e I maybe mean, this is E98, maybe? No, it's not 98. It's uh, 1913, you said? Yeah. Oh, I know what you're talking about. That's the Baseball Series Notebooks. That's the one in A. That's the E95. E95. Okay, so I've got that one. I've got a beautiful E95. This is um, one that was cut out of a notebook cover. So that's ah. why it's called a notebook. It was just like something for a school book. Um, it was made with the same front. It was hand cut. And that's why it's so ragged. But the E95 gotcha. is a beauty that I've got. Um, an SGC, yeah. I think it's a four or a five. Of course it is. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Josh, anything you want to say in closing? Yeah, of course. So I'm 18 years old. I'm still learning a lot about the hobby. I love talking to people like you and Andy and other collectors to learn things, to build my knowledge, you know, going forward. And I was wondering if you had any advice for me or other young new collectors in the hobby about uh, how to collect, what to collect. And, uh, you know, well, I collect good stuff. That's what I would do is I, I never was one to collect garbage. I think what you want to do is get the best stuff that you can in the highest grade that you can afford. I mean, I've got... I don't know, 250 maybe T206s. The great bulk of them are in sevens and eights. Um, I don't even know what I'm buying at this point, but I know that they're, I know that I like what they look like and I know that I like the high grade. But I would say that that's why I got into Cobb and that's why I got into Chase. These are people that people like to collect and I also care about them. You should read the books. I've read many books about Cobb. I've read every book about Hal Chase and buying the stuff it becomes a, uh, a passion instead of instead of work when i get cards delivered to me you know from an auction winning five minutes later i'm scanning them and putting them in my collection that's the kind of enthusiasm i have and i'm you know i'm you know 45 or 40 years older than you josh and i still have that kind of of passion that as soon as i get the card i want to scan it and i want to get it into my collection that's how i feel about it so what you need to do is buy what you love and if hopefully what you love is stuff that is high quality stuff so if you're going to spend my view is i'd rather have one high grade cool card from a top subject than you know four or five ratty cards uh, just because you want to have some volume so that's what i would right. probably say and that's how i got into cob that's why i started Great collecting advice. as high grade possible cobs as i could get um and like he's looked at that american uh, league publishing company uh, cob the white one where he's got he's wearing his medals um, in one picture and he's got he's holding the bat um, that's a PSA 6 I used to own a 1 that was actually also a nice looking 1 there's like you know 3 graded I bought the 6 and I sold the 1 I should have kept the 1 as well but if you can believe what I paid for what I sold the 1 for almost paid for what I paid for the 6 that's how rare the, co the card is so if you buy intelligently if you buy rare stuff if you spend money if you, if you buy it when it's available and you don't say, oh, I don't want it, there's a high likelihood that you're going to have a good return. At the end of the day, you're an addict, which is why we're here today on a holiday morning. And you want to be able to rationalize later, this was a good investment and I wasn't an idiot with my hard-earned money. Yeah. Great advice. Great advice. What are, your th what are your thoughts really quick? So you, I'm looking, you have, it looks like the whole set of the, what is it, the M MC or... or um, MP and Company. You know those 1943s? They're like cartoons. Yeah. I don't so, uh, so I don't know if you could see this. Because it's... Ah, oh man, you can't yeah. even see on this blur. Can you Can you make any of that out? It's the yeah, I know. Those are, those are well, strips. Yeah, the strips. So I, I don't know why my... Yeah, I don't know how to do my, my filter, but I was able to get the entire set in uncut strips. That's and cool. I think nobody... Uh, I think nobody else was even watching. I think I paid like a thousand bucks for the whole set. Now I was never into this, um, these this set. But when you get something, and this goes to the rarity. When you get something that is, you know, everybody has or everyone has seen these, but no one's seen the whole set in an uncut strip. Well, that's you know? that's that's a good point. That's how you get in some of your collecting. You know, I, I consider like avenues. Like if you look, I have the entire. 1948 Leaf boxing set, other than the Rocky Graziano car. Um, sure. It's uh, Marciano, I believe. Anyway, um, maybe it's Graziano. What happened was I bought like six of the cards in an auction when I was a very young collector, 
and I just thought they were cool looking. Well, once you get the thread that's pulled, and I had six of them, I had to complete the set. And then I had to upgrade the set. Now I've got like the fourth best set. And I don't even know that I like the cards, but I thought they were cool. Those are going to be the next yeah. set that I sell. By the way. Because the cards don't mean much to me, but there you go. There we go. Oh, yeah, those are beautiful. Go. Yeah, there you yeah. go. And those are goofy yeah. cards. But, you know, goofy. sometimes so goofy, goofy cards are, 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 are good cards. But and, one thing and I would also that. say to, to Josh is sometimes you collect stuff that's so rare that there's no market for it. I've got okay. these two Gasler bread cobs. Um, there's only two that are graded. I've got the entire population of the cob cards. So when you sell them to somebody, you've got to you know, convince them, well, this is a rare card. They've never seen it before because it's only in my collection. So yeah, sometimes that's a great best point. let other people. That's a great, a great to. point. A great point. Sometimes there are cards that are so cool, but so rare. And someone was just talking about, um, you know, the different Wagners that are out there and that there are other Wagner cards that are way rarer than the T206. But there's a fine line between too rare and perfectly rare. You know, the T206 is, is rare. It's a super famous set. But if you, it's not the rarest, there's not even the rarest T206 card there. I mean, there's way fewer blanks than there are. Yeah, I mean, Doyle. I don't think I've ever no. even seen one in person. But I've seen well, that's 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 the point is that as a collector, it can't just be rarity because if it's just rarity, you're going to miss out on really valuable Story. art. It's a combination Story. of rarity and appeal. And when you collect for decades, there is a massive amount of data points that go into your brain and your brain becomes a computer on how to know what to buy because it's all in there. You can't put it in writing because a lot of the stuff, you don't even know that it's in your brain, but you see a card and you know that the card is going to be valuable someday. I mean, I've, I've helped other people that have asked me coming into the collecting world, you know, can you pick out some cards for me that you think will go up in value? You know, you can't pick them in a second because not every card you got to sort of comb through, but I can look at any auction and know that I'm going to be buying a card that's going to go up that could double in a few years. I just don't bother because I just don't care at this point. But there's always right. they're always out there if you make the effort. Well, it's it's also you know with the whole craze that happened with COVID and all that fraudulent money that was out there, and um, and people buying a card uh, tonight to sell it tomorrow. Um, Crazy. And I've even there's even guys that are right now you know on on Facebook where they're going and they're they're bidding on cards. They win them. And then they offer it before the card even gets there, like at 30% more. You know, it's, it reminds me of the housing market back in 2007, yeah. 2008, where people were buying a home to sell the home. And that's not what homes were for. Homes are, you know, an investment that's great if you're living in it. But, you yeah. know, cards are great investments if you get enjoyment out of it and you buy it because you love it. And then, yeah, if you buy it right and you happen to have to sell it, you know, then, then yeah. But otherwise, no. it's, there are people. It's, there are uh, people on Net Fifty Four that will buy a card in a public auction. That anybody who's going to be buying that card from them can, is going to first look in VCP, and within a week, they're selling the card for a twenty-five or thirty percent markup. And I say to myself, "What does this guy do for a living?" I find <laughs> I out. Hope, I hope it's not this. He's yeah, usually like a. It's usually it somebody a, who's. So she's just an idiot looking for a quick, you know, hit. And it's usually a dumb person. And that's, you know, don't be that dumb person. Don't be that dumb person that buys a car on a Tuesday. It's in VCP. And then you sell it for 25% more. And you wonder why no one wants it. Um, there was so a, uh, a Walter Johnson pitching T206 card that I was bidding on. I, I think I was the underbidder. And I, I think it was a, a five or a six American. I, I could be off. I think it was an American Beauty back. And I wanted the card up to like maybe like six grand, five, six grand. And then after that, I was like, oh, he wanted it more than me. Literally within a week, it was on eBay for like 11 grand. I'm like, if I wanted to pay 11 grand, I would maybe what about bid you? But that's the thing that, you know, there's um there's a strip. I brought it because I want to show it off because it's one of my favorite things. It's the one with, uh, yeah, I know you have the one that's just these two cards. Yep. Now, when I bought this, um, I had, I've been looking for this for, for five years. Uh, I have, I had the Ruth. I've seen the Ruth Cobb, um, but I've been looking for the full strip. 
I'd only seen pictures on on like Google. And then one came up and I think the guy on eBay was asking fifteen grand and I bid him twelve and he sold it for twelve. Now, right after I bought it for twelve, it was like the national and a kid comes by to my like to you know, I see him carrying stuff. Show that he had two of them and he wanted he wanted something like ten grand for each of them or something like that. Like, oh my God. And I and I thought I can't believe I overpaid. But to me, this sits on my desk, and I don't plan to ever yeah. sell it. So it's one of those things. It's like it, it, I wanted it so badly. It's sitting here. It's it, it, you know the value is. I use a lot of my internal value. VCP only goes so far. Last sales only go so far. Yeah. For me, there's a you know how rare is this? How much do I love it? No, uh, there's a lot no. of internal. Yeah, and it should be because look, we spend so much time on this hobby. You should enjoy it. Um, you know, it's it's rare that there's anything in anyone's life that, that gets the joy that, that the hobby brings to us. We're very lucky in that sense that we have something that we love so much. So you want to cherish it and you want to, you know, the stuff that you care about, you keep close to your heart. Eventually, uh, though, you know, and I hate to say it, it's just cardboard. It's not life and death. And you got to be able to emotionally. And I think once you start selling, it probably becomes easier. But I'm going to start paring down my collection I would say this summer again, you know, as I said, I it's, I'm gearing up for the tuition um, season, which is going to be in August. And I've got to, I'm going to sell another $150,000 worth of cards to pay for sophomore year. Um, and I feel good cards. about it. I feel like it's the right thing right. to do. So I haven't decided what I'm going to sell, but I'm starting. And do you have any cards there to show us? Yeah, let me, I'm sure I've got some here, but you don't <laughs> see that's over to the right. This is a baseball card room and also a gun room. Um, okay. It, it's horrifying if you're <laughs> if you're a far leftist. What exists over here, right, is shocking. I've there seen it a, all. I li- I, I'm in Southern Florida. I mean, there is every a house, house comes with a gun room. There's a game used bat over there. But let me find something else. Oh yes, nice. Uh, game whole tour. All the good stuff is in uh, is in the bank or in a gigantic yes. safe. Um, here's a card that I love. Um, this is this is Hugh Jennings, and this is a Vassar sweater card. It was an advertisement. I've got yeah. him. I've got Sam Crawford, and I've got Ty Cobb, of course. Um, the right. Cobb was initially sold years ago. At different, there's only two in existence, and the Cobb was one of the cards that I regretted not buying when it came up to auction. I don't know why I missed it. I don't know how I missed it, but I didn't bid high enough and I missed it. Okay. For years, that was one of the cards, maybe the only Cobb card that I wanted and didn't get. And finally it came up again in an REA auction. And, you know, I would have had to, if I had to take out a loan on my house to get that card, I would have gotten it. And I bought it. I should have bought the first one. I bought this one in Cobb and, uh, that's one of my my happier card ending stories. It's really it's really freaking cool. I mean, it's I mean, uh, you're the first guest, and Josh has a great lineup. Uh, you'll love the comp. If we can get everyone who we have lined up, you're gonna love uh, the company that you're gonna be in. It's only like the top guys, and and your stuff is just unbelievable. I mean, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend the whole day just going through it again. And I just so you know, <laughs> I've been on your Flickr. I don't know if you can see who logs into your Flickr. I'm embarrassed if you can. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've been on it so many times. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think I think your stuff is just so cool. And it's crazy. That's not even it. all the stuff, Andy. That's no, I've got <laughs> entire sets, uh, 54, 55, or 55. You can't, scan, you can't scan sets. That's I can't. Thing. I scan the 55 is actually on there. Um, I've got 65, all slab. Sixty-five. Nice. Right. So many sets of cards that are sitting there that I just don't have the time to. The fifty-five set was different to me, so I scanned all of those, and I think it's only like two hundred uh, and some cards. But I've got so many full sets in sevens and eights, fifties and sixties tops cards that eventually I'll start to sell without ever scanning. Right. You know, but you, well, you, you Josh, can't make it to whole life. Just most of your life. 
Yeah. Josh tells me that none of this was ever a recording, so we'll just have to redo it. That's okay. <laughs> Tell me when. I'll, well, same time tomorrow. <laughs> That's so much fun. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you it. so much. Thanks for this having me, guys. And good Please luck. Guys, with whatever help I can offer, you know, feel free. Thank All you right. so much. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. Take care. You too.